It's Daniel Einspanger. I'm the uh, manager of the metrics engineering team at Mozilla, and it's my pleasure to speak with you today, share with you some of the various projects that my team has been working on uh, recently. If you have a computer handy, you can actually um, hit either one of these URLs and follow along or just bookmark them for later to be able to look at the uh, videos and such um, at your leisure. So first, a little bit about who we are at the metrics team. Um, we provide services to both the Mozilla Corporation, the organization, and uh, to the community. These services are along the lines of uh, traditional business intelligence, data warehousing, and then also uh, data services, which is the part that we're going to spend the most time talking about today. And that is basically going into other teams who have big data problems and applying our expertise to that. So for ETL, um, we use a tool called uh, Pentaho Data Integration. It's a uh, open source tool that makes it easy to um, visually construct transformations of your data, run them in parallel. Um, there's an enterprise version that uh, can be run inside of Hadoop, but it's also very possible to uh, integrate with Hadoop um, in other ways and to uh, to have various ways to process data from whatever the source is and uh, land it to a uh, HBase database, a Hadoop file system, or a traditional database. Um, so a little bit about the business intelligence aspect of this. When we acquire data from our log files, from applications, web services, or whatever, um, our analytic team is working on presenting this data to our organization and also to our community, um, determining what actionable decisions we can make based on this data, looking at market growth in different uh, uh, regions of the globe and things of that nature. Um, so the, the next piece, there's several different core technologies that we um, spend a lot of time working with uh, on the engineering side. And um, I wanted to go over a few of these briefly. I've already mentioned Pintao Data Integration. Vertica is a commercial closed source uh, column store database, but it is uh, extremely powerful. It's distributed. It is the tool that powers a lot of our dashboard and um, dynamic ad hoc uh, analysis systems that, that you'll see a glimpse of today. Um, the BI server from Pintaho is open source uh, Java platform. It's the, the harness around all of the dashboards and the, uh, the reports that we mail out and things of that nature. Um, Inside of the, the BI server, we work very closely with a group called Web Details uh, that makes a series of libraries for uh, data access, that's CDA, uh, dashboard building and editing, and also CCC is a engine for, that is uh, based on Protoviz that makes it very easy to take data sources and, and turn them into charts and such for web, uh, websites. Um, obviously, we're very big HBase users. Um, part of why we're here, uh, we we have a few different clusters that we use for various uh, purposes. One interesting piece of HBase use at Mozilla is that a significant portion of our use is much more real-time, high availability, rather than long-term uh, batch processing, where you fire off a job, you know, and it'll be ready in a couple of hours. These are things that that are continually working and uh, being uh, interacted with via websites. Um, we're also doing a lot of work with Elasticsearch, which is a Lucene implementation, very similar to Solar. We've, there's been a bunch of uh, really great presentations on Solar here. Um, Elasticsearch is, is very similar. Primarily, the, the difference is it was built from the ground up to be a distributed um, system based on Lucene rather than uh, solar, it, there's the solar cloud project and a few others that are, are being retrofitted to, uh, to provide sharding and, and distributed nature. Um, 
Hazelcast is the other interesting piece of this, and it is a in-memory data grid. Uh, basically, if you are thinking about stuff like a collection, uh, be it a map or a list or a queue, and you want to be able to deal with this data on more than one machine, um, then Hazelcast is a great little library to toss in to, uh, to be able to scale that out to multiple machines. Um, Bagheera is the final thing on this list. It is a REST service that, that we have built internally to service several of the projects that we're working on right now. It basically uses um, Hazelcast as a management um, infrastructure and then it can uh, read or write, we'll say, persist data um, to whatever back end it needs to go into, that HBase and Elasticsearch are two that, that uh, we're currently working with in projects. All of these links are to the various project uh, websites and open source repositories, so you can take a look at it later if you want. Uh, there's a couple of other technologies that are currently in use only for a single project uh, rather than, than core technologies. Lily CMS, uh, Stephen Knowles just gave a presentation a little bit ago on that. It's a really fun integration of HBase and Solar. Uh, SQL Stream is a streaming SQL engine that is actually currently powering our download counter website that some of you saw uh, before the, the talk started. And then React is also giving a few talks later on today. Um, they're a Dynamo flavor instead of a big table flavor like HBase is. Um, I wanted to mention all of these different things because uh, unlike several of the other speakers here, my primary purpose is to, to give you a taste of uh, the application side of things. Rather than showing you here's HBase or Hadoop and how to use it, I'm going to show you here's applications that we are using that are open source that you can take a look at that are built on top of these technologies. So uh, data services, I said we were going to spend some time looking at that. One of the first things that I wanted to mention is our Twitter um, data source. So Elasticsearch, that uh, index uh, text searching engine that, that uh, I mentioned before, has a system called Rivers. Rivers are basically plugins to the system that allow um, data to be either pushed into or pulled into the system in a continuing fashion. So there is a Twitter river that you can define um, filters using the, the Twitter streaming API uh, to have tweets flow into your Elasticsearch index. So Mozilla has a uh, Twitter river set up with um, uh, filters for Mozilla relevant keywords, uh, Mozilla users who are on Twitter, and also various other keywords for other browser vendors and things of that nature. We use that data source to be able to um, build dashboards and, and explore this data. Uh, so we can see the, the timelines of tweets for different types of uh, events. We can look at uh, uh, comparative analysis for the social sense of uh, what's happening and also potentially uh, see different things that might come up uh, in the blogosphere or the, the social uh, networking if there's problems or people are mentioning a, a new feature a lot or things of that nature. Um, this system is something that uh, any developer or team at Mozilla can uh, tap into if they want to, and there's been a couple of different uh, projects around that. Most notably is the Army of Awesome. Uh, project, which is uh, basically trying to crowdsource a lot of the feedback when somebody makes a comment about Mozilla or Firefox, they might have a question or a problem. They, if they put it on Twitter, then the Army of Awesome are people who are paying attention to this this feed of data and can reply to it and uh, make a, a a bit of a viral game out of it. So the next one is Bugzilla. Obviously, Metro, uh, Mozilla does a lot of. Uh, of things with Bugzilla. Not only do we use it for our product development, but we also actually use it for uh, project and team management. So new hires, they get bugs assigned to, to uh, create their accounts, to issue their hardware, to set up their desks. Um, IT requests, all of them flow through Bugzilla. Even our, our legal team uh, issues 
are created in Bugzilla for contracts that need to be evaluated and, and agreements that need to be made. Because of the extensive use, all of these teams are wanting to look at um, this data, not just retrieving a list of bugs, but to be able to analyze it and to be able to, to perform trending analysis. So that is uh, what this data source is about. Basically, we are indexing this, the, the Bugzilla data, every unique version of a bug over history, and then able to perform um, faceted queries to, to see trends over time. How long does it take a bug to be closed? How many bugs do, does each team member have broken down by priority or severity? Things of that nature. Um, me. So the next service that I wanted to mention is uh, our uh, community metrics project. This one is a really cool one because it's um, extremely oriented on not only being an open source project, but being open data. So we are mining our Mercurial uh, repository and uh, analyzing the check-ins and commits that, that have uh, contributor names or patch numbers or bug numbers in them. And we're able to build a dashboard, a set of data that the module owners and project managers can go in and take a look at community involvement, to be able to, to look at contributors who are just beginning to, uh, to take part in, in the development process of Mozilla, of Firefox or Thunderbird, um, or to look look at the people who used to be very fr frequent heavy contributors but have started to fall off and it gives these people a tool that they can reach out and talk to them see if there's a problem or something that they can help with if they're just uh, you know taking a break or or what we can do to keep our community healthy and and uh, live there um, this particular project doesn't have a lot of open source pieces um, available right now but it is under a security audit because uh, when we finish that, we're going to have not only the source code for these dashboards and for the, the ETL of the data, but we're going to have these dashboards available on our website for our community members to take a look at. Uh, there's several others that I didn't think I would have time to go into great detail on, but they're, they're well worth mentioning. Orange Factor was a uh, project that, um, is taking a look at intermittent failures in our tinderbox um uh, Tinderbox unit test system. I've skipped past a couple of things here. I'm going to have to try to go back. So Tinderbox is keeping track of all of the builds as they happen. And obviously, we want everything to be green, but uh, not everything always is. So if there's a red, that means somebody checked in something bad, and it has to be backed back out. But the orange ones are much more insidious. It's a temporary failure. It means sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It might be because of a network connectivity issue or um, a race condition, things of those, along those lines. Trying to get to the bottom of what is causing those is not easy from this simple interface right here because you need trending and analysis. So that's what uh, we worked with the QA and build automation teams to take all of the build logs from uh, the Tinderbox test runs um, parse them and store them in Elasticsearch and then provide them this Elasticsearch interface so that they can do faceted queries to be able to trend and analyze this data so that they can see what a particular orange looks like. Is it trending up? Is it trending down? Um, how frequently does it occur? Things of that nature. Um, let me go back to my first slide actually close these tabs so that I don't get lost. And uh, Mango is a project, again, uh, we have the initial version of it checked into our open source repository. There's, there's a lot more work to do there, but uh, we have several data centers around the globe. We want to be able to collect these log files and perform analysis on them. One of the main pieces of Mango that is interesting is not just that we're, we're squirreling away the data, but actually that we are doing 
um, immediate processing on these log records to extract the information that we need and separate it from the potentially personal information like cookies and IP addresses and user agent strings even, which could be used to fingerprint a person. Moving, we store these in two completely separate locations in HDFS so that we can um, apply our data retention policy and be very aggressive about how quickly we get rid of the, the sensitive data. Um, obviously, user privacy and, and um, protection of, of their data is extremely important to Mozilla being a transparent and, and user-driven community rather than a typical uh, for-profit company. So that's, that's one of the major things that we're doing there. Telemetry is the first um, production system that we've released under our Bagheera web service. Basically, telemetry is the ability in the nightly builds of Firefox to um, instrument probes into the code to be able to collect performance information. Um, the developers have been needing this for a long time because artificial benchmarks just aren't useful when you have an extremely large user base with a very um, different platform, uh, you know, multiple versions of, of Windows, multiple platforms when Mac and Linux. Uh, so telemetry is, an, is a tool that they can actually collect sound um, information about these, these, uh, these benchmarks. And where metrics fits into that is providing the back end where the, this data can flow into it. Um, Bigger is a simple REST service that the client can, can submit, post these, these uh, payloads, and they get batched up and submitted into HBase where they can then be used for analysis. Um, Grouperfish is another project that started this March, and uh, we hope to have the, the first major version of it ready in the summer. Um, it is a text clustering service, it's, it's going to be using um, Apache Mahout, Mahout I, I can never remember which way to say it. Um, and basically, the, the primary use case for it is input.mozilla.org. This is a uh, system where users of our nightlies and betas can provide feedback. Um, any comment, you know, a praise, a, a complaint, a problem, they can associate it with a URL or a domain that they're having a problem. So somebody can wave their hand and say, Facebook isn't working on this build or something along that line. Um, input has been running with text clustering for a while um, for betas and nightlies, but we want to be able to support our entire user base. And that requires a uh, lot more scaling. So that's what this service is, is uh, built around, to be a very distributed system to do incremental clustering and, um, and the ability to retrieve this data and perform analysis on it afterwards. So finally, we, ha we come to the, the most important one and the only one that was actually mentioned in the synopsis, um, and that is Socorro, uh, Mozilla's crash reporting and analysis platform. The, um, don't ever take that and turn it into an acronym or I'll get into trouble. Um, <laughs> so Socorro is a system where if a Mozilla product like Firefox, Thunderbird, even Sunbird or, or um, Sea monkey crashes, then the user is presented with a dialogue that uh, asks them if they want to submit the crash information to us for analysis. Now, I know a lot of people out there have seen these dialogues either from Windows or, or from Firefox maybe or something else and wondered if anyone ever looks at them. I can, I can swear to you that as far as Mozilla is concerned, these things are the lifeblood of our development and, and release process. Um, our release engineering team and our, our developers closely monitor crash stats to, to see what the, um, the trend is for crashes, uh, to see if a beta or a release candidate is, is trending downward and it's ready to, to hit release, or if we've had a sudden spike from a beta that has caused a regression that we didn't catch in testing. So um, anyone in the community can go to crashstats.mozilla.com and, and look at this data to be able to look at things like top crashers by signature um, and uh, get a sense for what might need to be worked on next. Um, is the problem that they're seeing something that a lot of other people are seeing? things of that nature. And we're going to touch on a couple of other different pieces of that. So um, 
one important piece of the this platform is that currently a lot of the data uh, when a crash report is received and processed, that processed data is stored in a uh, Postgres database. And um, when developers are using the, the uh, website, the Socorro website, they are performing textual type uh, searches on the data that is in this database. But it's not the best system. They would like to be able to do things like query for crashes where method B was invoked after method A, or look for crashes that have a particular type of signature but only have this shared library loaded or only have this add-on installed. Um, and also to be able to do more like this queries, to be able to look at a particular crash and say, you know, what other crashes are out in the system that are similar to this but don't necessarily have a, a, an identical signature. In order to perform that, we come right back to uh, search. You need full text searching and indexing. And uh, we've built a platform using um, Elasticsearch to be able to, to implement this. So we're using Bagheera as our REST service. Um, HBase is our primary data store backend for, for Socorro. Um, Hazelcast is the middleware management uh, items that are processed come into it and they're stored in a queue until they get indexed. And then uh, Elasticsearch is the, both the indexing system and also the, the query system that the Socorro web app uses to, to pull this data back out. So basically what happens is a crash report uh, consists of two primary pieces of data. A little bit of metadata about the crash, uh, when it happened, what product name what product version, what add-ons were installed, things of that nature, possibly even uh, user's email address or um, comments if they chose to put that information into the dialogue before they submitted it to us. Then there's also a uh, binary dump file, which is basically a, a miniature core dump um, that contains information we need to be able to look at the stack traces and to be able to uh, even debug it using GDB or something of that nature. Um, so when a crash report is received, it's stored in HBase and uh, it's picked up by a processor. The processor runs a utility called Minidump Stack Walk, which takes the dump file, turns it into the, the processed information that we need for the stack trace. And that data is then inserted back into HBase, the, the new data that was derived from it. And then also, I mentioned it's stored into um, Postgres. So this system is, this is where the, the, the new system is, is being integrated in. After a processor finishes, it's going to take the ID and post it to the, uh, the Socorro search service. That posted ID goes into a queue and the Hazelcast persistence layer actually takes care of uh, manipulating that data. We don't have to write any special um, queuing mechanisms to say, okay, it takes this long, we're gonna do this many at once or anything. We literally did nothing more than just write a config file that says, here's our persistence class that knows how to um, retrieve the data that we're interested in from HBase and post that data into Elasticsearch. And then after it's posted into Elasticsearch, it's available within just a few seconds to uh, be able to, to be searched on by the, the web app. So this is a JSON representation of, a, uh, of the process data from a crash report. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see, I know, but uh, you can see some information along the lines of when the client crashed, a uh, bunch, the, the large blob of data in the middle is, uh, is the, um, text that's extracted from the dump file, things like shared libraries that are loaded, uh, stack traces, uh, things of that nature. There's also file names for source files that are um, applied by the processor when it pulls in the debug symbols. And uh, using this data, we can basically perform a bunch of facet queries. Um, one of the things I mentioned to, to one of the solar presenters earlier is that uh, Mozilla, or at least the Mozilla metrics team does very little with uh, solar or Lucene technologies 
in the traditional sense of uh, performing a query on full text to be able to get a list of documents back. Everything that we typically do is much more around analytics. So if you look at some of these facet queries, we've got a date histogram that is basically breaking down the, the date processed field by hour. We have uh, several different term query or term facets. The first one is using some JavaScript to splice together several different pieces of product information. The end result of this query will be a list of each unique um, combination of this data along with how many documents there were that had this, this set of information. Uh, the next one for flash version is a much simpler uh, term query. The next one for OS source plus or OS name plus version name uh, together gives you your, your OS term. And the last one is interesting. It's a, a range query or a range facet, which allows us to take the install age of, of how long this particular version of Firefox has been installed on uh, the user's machine and bucket and, and analyze all of the crashes that are coming in grouped by different ages. So very young installs, uh, medium term installs, very old installs, to be able to look at the, the trends of that data and say, you know, did we release a version that is extremely crashy and as soon as people start running with it, they're crashing. Or if uh, we see a sudden spike in crashes for very old installs, then that most likely means something else has changed. Maybe an add-on has been updated that's caused a problem. Maybe a website has introduced a new feature that's causing crashes. Or unfortunately, one of the most common cases, Flash or uh, malware is uh, suddenly causing Firefox to to uh, to have trouble. Um, so those are the facet queries that that we run, and here's unfortunately uh, almost impossible to read a result that comes back from Elasticsearch on this. Uh, you can sort of see that it says uh, for the date processed histogram, the for the timestamp, uh, it's an epoch of uh, the the first one. There was a count of 339 crashes that matched that. For the next one, there's 139. For the last one. It's cut off and I can't tell you. Um, so those are the term type ones. And then for the ranges, you'll see that uh, uh, you can actually see the minimum, maximum, and mean values, which in our case aren't extremely important because we're looking at, at um, uh, static values rather than, than measures that, that are cumulative. But in many other cases, if you do have a numeric field and you're wanting to do these types of facet queries, you can, you can see a lot from the min, max, and, and uh, mean of this data. Um, so I am a, a little ahead of schedule. Um, before we get to questions, I, I will go ahead and uh, one of the slides, or pieces that I missed at the beginning was a dashboard that I wanted to demonstrate to you guys. This is uh, an uptake dashboard that is uh, used by our um, employees to be able to look at how uh, how long it takes particular versions of Firefox to, to uh, be adopted by users. So right here what we're doing is we're comparing 401 to 40 and we can see that 401 um, had a very long period where, with low adoption rates after it was released on day zero. And that is because we did not offer an automatic update for uh, over uh, for over a week just to make sure there was a couple of problems that we were concerned um, might be pervasive and we were waiting to see crash report, you know, our crash stat system, waiting to see the, the thousands to low millions of users if they were ex experiencing this problem before we push it out to hundreds of millions of users. Um, you can look at the comparative differences there. All of this stuff is, is extremely dynamic. Um, if we go and change it to look at the the differences between 3617 and 401, then we'll see that uh, actually it's, let me do 40 and 401, uh, 40 and 3617 because it's a better um, indicator. Uh, we've got the 40 is the teal, 
uh, looks sort of bluish on that display. And you can see that there is a very, very sharp spike on the first day of release because obviously we put a, a whole lot of publicity and, and uh, social drive into uh, getting people to pick that up, whereas 3.6.17, which uh, was primarily picked up by people through the automatic update system, has a fairly smooth curve for adoption. So these are types of tools that, that we um, build on various high availability, large scale systems and uh, make available both to the organization and also to the community. One of the great things about working at Mozilla is that uh, these applications are actually open source also. A lot of times you're, you're working with Hadoop, HBase, there might even be companies like stumbled upon as fantastic sponsoring HBase and doing a ton of development there. Um, but you don't get to see a whole lot about how they actually use it. Um, there was a presentation a couple of Hadoop worlds back where Yahoo had a presentation of how many Hadoop servers they had and there was a question that came up, you know, what are the specs on those? And the person had to sh frown and say, I can't really say anything about that. So at Mozilla, everything that we're doing from the way that we use the, the, the technologies, the applications that we're actually using ourselves, and as much as possible, the data that, that is coming out of those applications is all open source. Um, it, we could not exist without our community. Um, and we have a very different mission from most other companies. So that gives us the ability to do things differently, and it's a lot of fun. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. It might not be any because it's not uh, the typical presentation. Any questions? All right, then. Oh, here in the front. Okay. Uh, yes. Did you implement all these technologies you have integrated there uh, because of the need or because it's fun? Very much because of the need. Uh, to go back to HBase, for instance, the original version of Socorro was uh, storing crash reports on an NFS share, uh, on, a, on a filer. And the filer was mounted through NFS to various collectors and processors. So a crash report would come in, the, the collector would take that, that uh, those two pieces of data I talked about, store them on the filer in a very deep nested hierarchy because if you ever have a directory on a traditional file system with, you know, 10,000 or a million files in there, it doesn't tend to be very happy with you. Um, so even with this very deep structure and, uh, you know, multi-terabyte filer, there was a growth cur limitation there. And when they looked at uh, things that they wanted to start doing, they wanted faster processing, they wanted the ability to go back in time to, to look at older crashes, um, and they wanted to, to increase the, the durability of this data, they needed different technology. And so we looked at Hadoop. We started with a naive Hadoop implementation, and then because of the small file uh, issue in Hadoop, we needed something that could batch these up into groups. Rather than rolling our own, we ended up going with HBase, and it's been a fantastic system. So each one of these has been a, a system that, that was originally evaluated because of some need at Mozilla and has uh, grown into a core technology that is useful to us in many different areas. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, guys. Um, if you have questions, feel free to, to email or, or snag me, and uh, have a great rest of the, the conference. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you.